Amen. We show in the name of Jesus Christ. Welcome you back into the house of the Lord. Amen. To continue our meetings from yesterday. I believe we're all still under expectation. Amen. And that it will be a blessing as it was yesterday. Amen. We just sing hallelujah, hallelujah in key F. Lord, we praise you for the last time. 
something when the saints of God just raise their voices and worship you Lord Jesus Lord we can feel your atmosphere coming down upon us may you just come and bless us this afternoon Lord I pray Lord some of us have come with desires upon our hearts we've come under expectation Lord Lord may you come Lord and may you answer each and every one of us Father I commit Lord each and every one into your hands now Lord Lord those that are seeking healing Lord, those that are seeking deliverance. Father, we know there is deliverance in this place because your word is here, Father. We pray, Father, through the singing of the songs, Lord, that you may deliver someone, Lord. You may heal someone. And when the word comes forth, Lord, may they be, Lord, a transformation in this place, Lord. We commit it into your powerful hands, Lord. Be with us, Lord. Lord, may you bless the service, bless the minister that shall come forth, and bless your children. Tation. Lord, may we be able, Lord, to be at liberty in your, in your presence, Father God Almighty. I commit the service into your hands and the preaching of the word. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. And I'm very happy to be in the house of the Lord. We had a wonderful two services yesterday. I'm looking forward to today. Amen. Hallelujah. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Amen. When we all see Jesus who will sing and shout the victory. Just one thing, we'll say just one thing. 
and shout the victory when we see Jesus. Amen. God is good all the time. We'll sing that song. God is good and all the time. Hallelujah. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of my God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, His light will shine. time God is good oh say God is good all the time he put a song of praise in this heart of mine God is good all the time through the darkest night his light will shine God is good he's so good God is good, oh God is good, he's so good, God is good, God is good, God is good, he's so good, God is good, all the time, hallelujah, just take your seats at this moment, amen, he put a song of praise in my heart, is so good. Amen. I've got a special from the choir this morning. Amen. Just as they come forward, we'll sing, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Amen. Key D. Bless the Lord, O oh, my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Oh, bless the Lord, O oh, my 
my soul and all that is within me bless his holy man he has done great things oh now he
a blessing. Amen. Just like Paul and Silas, they sang until the chains fell off. Amen. So sometimes we need to sing until those chains fall off. Amen. We just want to do that this afternoon. Let's just stand to our feet together. We tried this song, I'm no longer a slave to fear, but I am a child of God. Amen. KD. You unravel me with a melody, oh, you surround me with a song of deliverance, oh, of deliverance from my enemy. Oh, till all my fears are gone, I'm no longer, oh, I'm no longer a slave to fear, oh, I am a child of God, I'm no chosen me oh your love has called my name I've been born again oh I've been born again oh into your family oh your blood flows through my I'm no longer a slave oh child of God. Oh, I am a child of God. You split 
send his word is because each one of you amen you're a seed of God amen let's just bow our hearts and just thank him for all that he's done for us all gracious heavenly father Lord how can we come Lord with father or God Lord with words that would that could express father the love that you loved us with before the world was and to try and express that back to you in human lips father lord we could do it in the way of praise father the sacrifice of our lips oh god lord and father oh god in the gratitude of what you've done for us lord we're just laying our lives upon the altar father lord giving ourselves to you father lord to be that living sacrifice father Lord, we're just so grateful, Father of God, for everything that you do for us. Lord, how that you could take hold of your word and bring it into our hearts, Father, and sow it in there in such a way, Father of God, it would transform us, Father. Lord, that we can say this, morning, this afternoon, Lord, we're not what we used to be. Hallelujah. Oh God, Father, we're, Lord, we have a prize that we're striving for, Lord. And Father, oh God, we just ask, Father, that you'd, Lord, just take hold of us this afternoon, Lord. Oh God, speak to us, Father. Lord, and as we come, Lord, with thanksgiving in our hearts, Lord, for the great things that you've done for us, Lord. Oh Father, we can just, Lord, offer you, Father, Lord, oh God, what you have already given us, Father. Lord, as we, Father, return to you, Father, Lord, that token, Father, or oh God, of our tithes, Father, or oh God, our offerings, Lord. We just ask, oh God, Lord, that, it, Father, or oh God, you'd receive them, Father. Lord Jesus, just as you received those tithes and offerings from Abraham, Father. And Lord, we being that royal seed of Abraham, Father, with the same promises, the same privileges, 
we just want to say thank you, Father. We ask for your blessings, Lord, this afternoon, Lord, that you, Lord, just take hold of us as a, Lord, a, a group of people, Father. Lord, not just any people, Father. Oh God, Lord, for you've called us from the east and the west, from the lands of far, Lord, you've called us to dine with you today, Father, to feast with the King, oh God. Lord, we just offer to you, Father, this service. May you, Lord, just have liberty, Father. Take hold of the minister, Father, again, Lord. Oh God, may that channel be an unblocked channel, Father, a channel of inspiration, Lord, that will again just meet the needs of your children. We just thank you now as we commit the service, the remainder of the service into your hands. Lord, we're so grateful for you. We thank you, Father, and we love you, Father. Lord, we thank you for the great promises that you give us, Father. Every, every morning, Father, oh God, they're new, Father. Hallelujah, so grateful we are. Lord, to think of this great oneness, Father, that you, you're gathering us to, Father. Oh Lord, oh God, the same oneness, oh God, Lord, that you had with the Father, the same oneness, oh God, here represented, Father, in your people, Lord. What a jubilee it is, Lord. We thank you now and just commit the service to you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. As we continue in this time of worship and prepare our hearts for the coming of the Word, Amen. We just sing the song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Amen. Amen. Just have the right mental attitude at this moment. Amen. As we sing these songs. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. I 
you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Just focus on the Lord now. As we get into this time, prepare our hearts for the coming of the word. Amen.
blessed time, what a blessed season, to just rejoice as we are in his presence. Praise the Lord. I think I will not take too much time and say much because the atmosphere is right. Amen. We came expecting to feast with the king. Amen. The word says so, for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered. I would like to appreciate uh, those that are visiting with us. Amen. Just want to welcome you. Amen. And want to certainly appreciate the saints. I see a few from the Huntingdale hunting Fellowship. God bless you and thank you for coming. It's wonderful to gather together at the table. Amen. And feast with the king. So we are certainly happy to see you all and just to feast around these things that we commonly share and believe. Praise the Lord. If there are any others that may be from somewhere else, maybe not necessarily Huntingdale, you are welcome in the house of the Lord. Amen. And we certainly count ourselves privileged this weekend that God has been gracious to us. He has sent his messenger, he has sent his servant, uh, Brother Chad Lamb, to come and pass our way. Amen. I'm sure there's many places in the world you could have been. But God uh, gave us grace that we could have him around, and so it's been a pleasure. We've been blessed tremendously in the past two meetings, and we are not expecting anything less this afternoon. Praise the Lord. And then after the service this afternoon, uh, we will be able to share some moments of fellowship in the foyer, uh, and we clear, we'll try and be cleared out of there around 5.50, 5.45, 5.50, we try and clear out. So if there's any fellowship that we can do, we can always do it outside. So there will be refreshments, beverages, and stuff like that in the foyer area just for us to catch some moments of fellowship with one another and with our brother. And then when the time approaches 5.45, we clear out to the outside. And then the, uh, the fellowship can continue. Those that want pictures with each other or with the brother, you can take the opportunity amen to do so and so just enjoy one another enjoy the fellowship uh to those that know uh we have our special box right there uh the uh the very first one from this entrance we have that box there that at the end of the service you can go there and you can be able to place your love offering in there but we are just under expectation to hear from the lord amen and i think when the prayers have been said Amen. The singing has gone forth the way it has. Expectant hearts have gathered. There's not much more that can be done but to introduce the preacher. And so we want to appreciate Brother Chad and the liberty that he's had. And as we invite him to the pulpit, we want him to continue in the same channel. Amen. And say the warm weather that you are enjoying is also a reflection of our warm hearts. Amen. We are warm to the word and we are warm to the, to the people of God. Amen, but it's a privilege. I've enjoyed moments of fellowship and, and, and just listening to the word and, and, and sharing experiences of what the Lord is doing in the different parts of the world that we operate in. It's been tremendous. I'll just read a small portion of the message from the message and exposition of the seven church ages. The prophet says, From a little group of the true seed of the word, God will present Christ with a beloved bride. She is a virgin of his word, 
She is a virgin because she knows no man-made creeds or dogmas. By and through the members of the bride will be fulfilled all that was promised of God to be made manifest in the virgin. Praise the Lord. By and through the members of the bride will be fulfilled all that was promised of God to be made manifest in the virgin. That portion speaks of you and I. Amen. By and through us. Amen. God intends to fulfill all that he has promised to fulfill through the virgin. Amen. I think it speaks of wonderful things. So we shouldn't be looking aside. We're looking at ourselves and say it's you and I that we have to fulfill this portion of the scriptures, even as we had yesterday. Amen. We'll sing a song as we welcome our brother and give him the liberty of the pulpit that the Lord may come and use his gift to speak to God's people. Praise the Lord. Amen. I think let us sing that song. Um, let us sing. I think it's Father of Life, if you can check, or Father of Light. Never failing truthful king. It's only by your mercies that we are saved. Praise the Lord. So, oh, we cry out. Praise the Lord. Father of life. Seated on your throne of grace, it's only by your mercy we are saved. Oh, and Lord, you have said, if we call upon your name, oh, we and our families will be saved.
God bless you all once again, amen. It's good to be back together again. It seems like it goes so fast. You think you have a weekend, you have three meetings, and you've got some time together, and next thing you know, it's the last service. So we're going we're gonna to miss you all. I'm glad we got to come and see you. Really appreciate your hospitality, your warm welcome, the handshakes and the hugs and the encouraging comments. I want to say God bless each and every one of you. It's been my privilege to be here. And I told the church back home, you know, most of the time, most of us have to wait till the marriage supper to meet each other. But it's my privilege to get to come and at least meet this portion of the bride on this side. I want to say God bless you. It's been great. We appreciate Brother Michael and his wife Abigail and their hospitality for caring for us there. And it's been really nice. And I just want to say we love you all. And if you ever make it to Ohio, come and see us. We'd love to see you there as well. While we're standing, let's just take our Bibles together and turn to 1 Corinthians 13. Go we'll right into the Scriptures, 1 Corinthians 13. And just before we read, let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for the privilege of gathering again. God, you've watched over us, you've protected us, you've kept us, Lord. And by your drawing power, you've drawn us back to another service. Lord, we know we're not standing here on our own because we brought ourselves, but we know, God, it's your mercy and your grace in our lives. And God, as we stand here, Lord, and look into your scripture, I pray that you would open our eyes of understanding, give us a heart to perceive all that you want to speak to us today. And Lord, I'm so thankful, Lord, that you've allowed us to be here and that you've given us of your word. And Lord, may that word come into our lives and change us and bring us into your very image. May we be made in your likeness and molded after your fashion. And may we be your representation upon this earth. Lord, we need your molding. We need your hand, Lord, because you're the potter, we're the clay. We've come here today to lay ourselves on your spinning wheel, Lord, and may you by your word come and shape us into that desired image you have of us. We want to yield unto you and give you the preeminence this afternoon. We ask that you take it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. I mean, let's look at 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, and we'll begin there. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. So when we, we're going to read this word charity several times, but the word charity is actually the word love. It's the same Greek word as translated love as here translated charity. So in your mind, I want you to think of love because we would understand it as love in the day we live in. So though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not love, I am become a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not love, it profiteth me. Namely, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, evil, geth no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Let's go all the way down to verse 13 now. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, which is love. These three but the greatest of these is love. And God bless you as you take your seats. For the service this afternoon, I'd like to speak on the subject of the atmosphere of love. The atmosphere of love. When we look at the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul had an outstanding ministry. He, he had done many mighty things. He had traveled around a great part of the earth sharing the gospel and and had been a witness of the resurrected life of Jesus Christ, and had preached the word, not in word only, but in the power and demonstration of the gospel. And he had all kinds of gifts operating in his life, and he had, uh, he had a, a good, perfect revelation of Jesus Christ that he received from Christ himself on the, on the, on the, on the uh, desert of Arabia. But then he comes down and he says some outstanding things. He said, though I speak with tongue of men and angels and have not love, I'm become a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. Sounding brass and tinkling cymbal is just noise. So he said, though I can speak with tongues so I can do all of these things, it's just 
at the end of the day, if I don't have love with it, it's just a bunch of noise. Then he says, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. In the day and age we live, these kind of gifts, this kind of ability of prophecy and, and understanding mystery and faith enough to remove mountains, boy, it would make somebody a superhero in the religious world. They would be everything. But the Apostle Paul said, if I have all that without love, it's nothing. He said, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. So at the top, at the pinnacle of it all is love. At the foundation of it all is love. And at the pinnacle of all is love. And love encompasses it all. Now when we talk about love, when we, when we speak of the word love, everybody has a, a thought or an idea of what love is. And if you speak the English language, love is a, it's a word that's so cheaply used sometimes. Sometimes people say, I love ice cream. Well, that's a different kind of love than we're talking about here. That's an affection or a feeling or a strong desire. But this kind of love is agape or agape in love in the Greek. And, and to get a definition, I just went to the concordance and I pulled out. There's a write-up in the concordance from a, from a German scholar in trying to understand the difference between filio and agape love. And Brother Branham talks about this all the time because the word filio or filion in the Bible is also translated love. But it's a love of friendship and it's a love of emotion and a feeling and affections. But this, uh, this agape love is the love of God. It's a different kind of love. It's actually a superior love, but its, base, its basis is based on something different. Filian love is based on how you feel. Agape love is based on something different. And this is what he said. The verb agapen is the love of intelligence, reason, and comprehension coupled with corresponding purpose. I'm going to read that again so that we can catch it. This love is the love of intelligence, reason, and comprehension coupled with corresponding purpose. So this is a love that comes from a revelation, a proper understanding, an, an, an intelligence, a reason, a comprehension. God has perfect comprehension, perfect intelligence, perfect understanding. And he coupled that love with a corresponding purpose. There's a purpose to a love. <clears throat> and it says, in this, it is, in its content, it vastly outranks the other type of love. And filial love, or filial love, expresses the love of mere personal affection or liking, including even the passions where the context requires. And no intelligence or high purpose is involved. This content places the verb on a low level. It could never be said of God that he filii, the sinful war, world, as far as filian is concerned. He could only abominate the foul world. But the scripture says that God so loved the world. Well, that love is not an emotional feeling kind of love because God could never feel good feelings towards an abominable world. It wasn't emotional. It was based on intelligence and understanding with corresponding purpose that God would love because he knows the condition of the world and how it got into that condition. That's what was this superior love. It comes from understanding, comprehension, reasoning, and purpose. The other one is the response of passions and likes and emotions. He said, now he's going on with the same thought. Jesus never asked us to love our enemies in the sense of filion. He never himself loved his enemies in that way. But agapo love, yes, with this love did God love the world. And we can love our enemies comprehending all that is wrong, sanctifying the world, converting our enemies. Compare, that, compare John 3.16 and every other passage in which either of the verbs is used in the gospel, only in a few cases where either type of love would apply, either verb might be used. But even then, this great distinction will remain. The two are never equal. So I hope we understand when I say I, I, I love my dog, I lo the, that, that kind of love is not like God loving the world. And it's not the way we're to love our enemies. It's not based on my affection or my response, a, an emotional response towards something. It goes beyond the emotions. It's not attached to the emotions. Emotions can come with it, but it doesn't. It's not an outcropping of the emotions. It's an outcropping of understanding, revelation, intelligence, and reason, and comprehension with a purpose. 
And that's how God loved the world, and that's how God asked us to love our enemies, and that's how God asked us to love. And this is the kind of love that the Apostle Paul said, if I have all the gifts and all understanding and I have everything, it's nothing if I don't have this love. Because the Bible says God is love, and he's not talking about filial love, he's talking about the perfect love, godly love, this is God. So Paul now is saying, I've got... With all the gifts and all the understanding and everything I've got, I've got to get to the level that God's at because God is love. Amen. So let's just keep moving. And now we're on the same basis when we talk about love. We're, we're, we're talking about something beyond in the emotional realm. Brother Bram said in the message titled Love from 1957, he said, the reason I chose this tonight is because my theme has always been love. I think love is the most powerful force that the world has because God is love. And there's no more powerful force than God, and love is one of the greatest things that I could speak of. Amen. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but uh, long ago when I was a boy in the, in the Pentecostal church, <clears throat> we would talk about love all the time. But that kind of love never appealed to me because it was a love where everything was accepted. It was a love where you had to be nice and you had to be gentle and you had to be all these things. You never stood for anything. You never had a backbone. You never had a spine. That's not the kind of love that this is talking about. Love is a powerful force. It was, it was love by which God created the world. It's love by which God redeemed the world. It's love. God's love is also corrective. Love's not a pushover. Love doesn't accept everything, but love for the benefit of the one loved will actually even bring correction. That's true love. That's this love with understanding, intelligence, and purpose. It's, a, it's the kind of love that you punish your children with, amen? Not the kind of love that's all feeling and emotional. You can be weeping in your heart when you're administering punishment to your children. It can be breaking your heart. It's not a feel-good feeling, but you're not doing it based off your feelings. You're doing it based off a higher realm of love that comes from perfection because you understand that if I allow this to go, they're going to be harmed and that's going to hurt them long term. So I'm willing to push down my emotions and bring a higher level of love on the scene for your sake because I've got a purpose behind it because of revelation. That's the love we're talking about. That's when we get into the love of God. Listen, it was the love of God who created Eden. And it was the love of God who pushed man out of Eden when he fell. It was the love of God who put them, uh, uh, them cherubims with the flaming sword to keep them from the tree of life so that they wouldn't eat in a fallen condition without redemption and eat and live forever in a fallen condition with bodies that keep aging. They can never die. They just keep deteriorating and deteriorating. It was the love of God that pushed them away and put flaming swords there until the price of redemption is finished and the redemption cycle is done. He can bring us back through a change of the body right back into eternal life where there's no deterioration, no weakness, no sickness. But until then, he was holding them off. That's this kind of love. All right. And Brother Branham said, my theme has always been love. And it's the most powerful force the world has because God is love. When in the message it is the rising of the sun, he's talking about the breaking of the new day in, in Eden. And he says, and the first light was ever given on the earth was God's spoken word. The first light that ever struck the earth was God's spoken word. He said, let there be light, and there was light. That turned darkness into light in order to bring forth a creation of joy and life upon the earth. Then the Spirit of God, as it moved with love and compassion at the great day, the first day of the dawn of creation upon the earth, the sun rose and swept across its rays and dried up the waters from the earth and made an atmosphere above. And for the first time, it was to bring joy and life to the earth by a seed. That was a great hour. God formed Eden. Eden means pleasure. Eden is God's pleasure, and he formed it, and he, and he brooded over it in the Holy Ghost with love and compassion as he brought everything up according to what he desired. And the atmosphere in Eden was love. It was God's love on display, and, and God's love would make a man, and he would make a man after his own image, 
and God's love would place him in the garden, and then God's love would say, it's not good that man should dwell alone. And Brother Bram said, yeah, he saw Adam alone because God was alone, because, that, because creation is reflecting something about God. God is displaying something so that we could see what he's doing and we can learn about him. Amen. So now Adam's alone because God's alone, and he says it's not good that man should dwell alone. I was preaching, and I, I don't remember where. I think it was Melbourne, and I was saying, how could God say it's not good? He's the one who did it. There was nothing made. There was nothing in Eden. There was nothing there except what God had done. And now God looked at what he'd done, and he said, it's not good. That boggles my mind. But he, does, he didn't say that for his benefit. He said it for our benefit. He wants us to see that it's not finished yet. It's an unfinished masterpiece. It's not good yet that man shall dwell alone. So he, for, he formed the woman out of the man and brought them together, united them together. This was God's love. They were dwelling in the atmosphere of love, and they had love one for another because they came from one another. They were connected to one another. And in the atmosphere of love, they lived. And, and God, when he had united them back together, he looked at all that he had made. And when he looked around, he says, it is very good. It went from not good to very good, and what changed between not good and very good? Only one thing changed. He pulled the woman out of the man and put them back together, and that made not good very good. This was God's creation of love as he moved with compassion and love in that great day and formed everything by his love according to his desire to reflect himself. And so Eden was in an atmosphere of love, Adam and Eve had perfect love for one another. And I, I find this interesting. They had a perfect kind of love. It wasn't based on feelings and emotions. It wasn't based on so many times what trivial or superficial love is based on what we see all around us. Uh, I could say it this way. Adam didn't love Eve because she washed his clothes. There was no clothes to wash. Didn't love Eve because she kept house. There was no house to keep. He didn't love Eve because she cooked dinner. There was no dinner to cook. He loved Eve because Eve was part of him. It was a pure love. It wasn't based on anything else. It was a genuine, pure, holy love of God on display. He loved her because she belonged to him and they belonged to each other and they came from one another. It wasn't service. She didn't love Adam because he had a better job. He didn't have a job. He didn't, she didn't love Adam because Adam made more money than the next guy. Adam didn't make any money. And she didn't love Adam because he was handsome or there was nobody to compare him to. You see, it wasn't a superficial love. It wasn't a human love. It had nothing to do with that. It was a pure, holy, godly love. And it was based on the, the higher understanding that those two were united because they came from one another. They were united to one another. They were two parts of the same being. They were both, amen. In and, and, uh, Genesis chapter 5, it says this is, the, this is the record of Adam when God made man. And the, and the day God made him, he made him male and female, made he them, and called their name Adam. They had one name. Two beings with one name because God says what God has put together, let no man put asunder, the two shall be one flesh. So there was a higher understanding in this love. So it's not like Eve could ever be worried that Adam wouldn't love her if she didn't perform. If all of a sudden something changed in life and she become uh, uh, unable to wash the clothes or do the dishes or keep the house. She had no worries. Praise God. Adam wasn't worried if she would run off if he lost his job and became a poor man. He had nothing to worry about. Their love was perfect. They were in the atmosphere of perfect love. They loved one another. They had a pure and they had a holy love because it came from this level of revelation, this level of understanding. It wasn't based on their emotions. And that's why we see love become so trivial in the day we live in. People love each other one year, and the next year they don't love each other anymore. They get married, and they get divorced, and, 
And now they're so afraid of getting divorced, they don't even get married. They just live together. Why? Because it, the, the whole realm is based on emotion. It's based on human feeling. And it's based on all these trivial things. But, but our love and our loves even in our marriages should go beyond the emotion. It should go to a higher level and say, this is God's choice in a spouse for me. This is the predestinated plan of God. Before the foundation of the world, God saw these two attributes connected together. And what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. It goes so much higher than the emotions because when you're in a relationship, your emotions can go high, your emotions can go low. You can be happy, thrilled, so excited that God's given you a spouse. And 10 minutes later, you can be so frustrated you're to the point of tears. That's life. I hope that's not just in the United States. Maybe when you fly to the other, to the southern hemisphere, everything changes and we're in a utopia of perfection and Perth. But if human nature is the same wherever humans are, then what I speak is the truth. So people say they fall out of love with each other. Come on. Your emotions changed. You had a low level of love. But for the believer, our relationship shouldn't be like that. There should be an atmosphere of love like was in the garden. But we know, we know that Eve would fall by deception. She would be deceived by the serpent and she would fall. And when she fell, Adam had to make a choice. His choice was, would he remain as God of the earth? Would he remain with the title deed of redemption? Would he remain in the garden or would he forsake it all and go with his wife? He had to make a decision, and I don't know how long the decision took, and neither do I intend to speculate. It may have took him a fraction of a second. It may have took him 10 minutes. I don't know what it took. But in the end, his love, his love moved him to go with her. Brother Branham said, yonder I see Adam and Eve, that first little sweetheart's there in the Garden of Eden. I see Adam back there, when he put his arm around his little sweetheart to walk out with her, for God had condemned them. And he started out with his arms around his darling. Adam was not deceived. He didn't have to walk out, but he walked out because he loved his wife. He walked out with both eyes wide open. No matter if she had to go to torment, he'd go with her. Amen. This was, a, this was not filial love. This was not a based on feeling. This was so much higher than that. He knew she was part of him. He could not forsake her because she was part of him. If he forsook her, it's like forsaking himself. He has such a higher level of understanding. <clears throat> so he would walk out and take her judgment. He would give up. He would forsake the title deed. He would give up his, his, his rulership over the earth. And he would sell all of his offspring into condemnation by going out with her but he could take no other choice. Love would allow him no other action. Yeah, I ask you, would it have been, it would have been right for Adam not to have gone? Would that have been right? Would it have been right for Adam to say, you know what, the word said don't, and you messed up, and you're going to be condemned, and you're going to be killed unless I do something for redemption, but I've got to stay in the garden and I've got to hold my position and, and I, and would that have been right? Would that have been love? It's amazing. Adam had to do what was wrong in order for love to be made manifest. He had to go with her for redemption. He had to go with her to save her life. He had to go with her and he left all of that and forsook it and he had to, he had to choose to do wrong in, in order for love to be made manifest. And he was foreshadowing a Savior that would come from heaven and give up glory and choose to come down and step out of perfection into this life to save us. He didn't have to do wrong to do it, but he had to step down from glory to step into this dimension, to be spit on, to be cursed, to be rejected. All for what? All for the love he had for his wife. So in this atmosphere of love, everything in the garden was perfect. It was a sweet atmosphere. It was a holy union. Everything was in harmony. The, 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 all of creation was in harmony under this atmosphere of love. But then Eve fell. Adam, he went with her. <clears throat> Amen. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5 together.
Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 says, Submitting one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So it looks like he's talking about a man and a woman, but he's actually talking about Christ and the church. And he's using this as an analogy, and he's saying, no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherishes it and love it and gave himself for it. Amen. And, and he tells, he said, uh, husbands love your wives as Christ did and gave himself for it. Why? This was perfect love. He gave himself for his wife. Why? Because he was loving his own self. She was part of him. We're his body. We're his flesh. According to the scripture, it says we are his flesh and his bones. We are part of Christ, and Christ left glory. Amen. Not for an emotional reason. There was a lot of emotional reason. Listen, God was all the time getting angry with Israel. His chosen elect seed. He was angered with them and they, they, they angered him and his wrath was kindled over and over and over again. He had all kinds of emotions, amen, but he had a higher understanding and a higher love that would continually bring them back and bring them back and bring them back and bring them back. Amen. So now he's telling us to love because a man to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. He sacrificed. So now we begin to see that love is understood by sacrifice. We understand love by sacrifice. We understand Adam's love for Eve because of what he sacrificed for her. And for us, we can see that love. Now we can understand Christ's love for us because of a sacrifice of himself, what he endured at Calvary, what he went through on this earth. He did it for us. And now we can begin to understand love by sacrifice. And that's what he's showing us here that a husband should do for his wife, sacrifice himself for his wife because his wife will begin to understand his love by his level of sacrifice. And it goes both ways. So we begin to understand. And God is creating an atmosphere of love for the church to step into and recognize how much he loves them and how secure they are in his love and how much higher his love is than emotions so that he can create an atmosphere in the new church of love where they're secure in his love. And that's the atmosphere of love. Amen. 1 John 4.19 says we love him because he first loved us. So he had a sacrificial love for us and we have a reciprocating love to him. We love him because he first loved us. If he didn't love us, there was no way for us to love him. Our love is in reciprocation of his love for us. And if we weren't part of him before the foundation of the world, we would have no capacity to love him because he loved us because we were part of him. And now we love him back because he loved us first. So his love is sacrificial based on an agape love, a love of understanding and reason with purpose. And now our love back to him is because we witnessed his sacrifice, we understand what love is, and now we can love him back. And he set the stage, the atmosphere for true love. True love is self-giving. True love is sacrificial. True love brings real security. And the church began in the first age to flourish in this love. They knew they were accepted. They knew that they were loved. They knew their sins were abolished. They knew they were completely secure in his love. Amen. Brother Bram says, his love did it. His love paid for my sins. His love taken it away. Love is the most powerful force there is. Take a husband that really loves his wife. He'd die for her. Why? Because love is known by sacrifice. 
That's true in every setting. Love is known by sacrifice. You know how your children will know that you love them? By the level of sacrifice you have for your children. What will you do without so that they can have? What, what, what ma- amount of your time, what amount of your resources, what amount of your happiness will you sacrifice so that your children can prosper? That's how your children will recognize your love and reciprocate it back. How many sleepless nights will a mother have to nurse a baby, to take care of one that's sick? How many fathers will work and sometimes work a second job for more shoes, for dental care, for, for eye doctors, for clothes? Why? We understand love sacrificially. Amen. It creates an atmosphere of love, and then we love him because he loved us first, and now our children can reciprocate our love. Now a wife can reciprocate a husband's love because the husband's level of sacrifice for the wife. That's why when there's no level of sacrifice, the marriage begins to deteriorate. When he won't sacrifice for her and she won't sacrifice for him, all of a sudden it begins to fall apart because we understand true love by sacrifice. And that's how we understand God's love for us. Amen. When selfishness, self-preservation, amen, greed and, and pride enters into the picture, it destroys the atmosphere of love. It destroys it in our homes when, when, when selfishness creeps in and, and, you know, and, and one person wants one person to do a job and one wants the other to do it and neither one wants to sacrifice their time, neither one wants to sacrifice their energy, neither one wants to give up anything, but everybody wants to get as much as they can and keep as much as they can in the relationship and all of a sudden there's a breakdown in the atmosphere of love in the home. And then contention slips slips in, and we begin to bite and devour one another. Why? Because we simply understand love by sacrifice. Amen. Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4. We read this yesterday. At least we read, we're going to read part of what we read yesterday. First Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. So we're going to be talking about the divine nature, the nature of God. How, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So how did corruption enter into the world? Lust. We look at the word lust, and many times we think lust, we, we think of it in terms of a, a sexual lust. Lust just means a desire. Sin, corruption entered to the world through lust because Eve lusted for a knowledge she wasn't supposed to attain to. Brother Bram said she didn't want to do that, but Satan showed her that it was a, a better way. She didn't know, but she wanted to know, so she lusted to know something that God didn't need for her to know or tell her to know. He told her just not to eat of the tree, amen, but the serpent come along and beguiled her and created inside of her a lust, and the whole world fell into corruption because of lust. And that's what we're all fighting and what we're still fighting today in ourselves is that old lust, amen? When we, back home, when we use the term lust, it's almost always attached to fornication or impurity, but that's not what it means. Lust means when you want a promotion at work and that's all you think about, you're lusting for that promotion, right? When you wake up in the morning and all you want is a cup of coffee and you can't think about nothing else, you're lusting for a cup of coffee. Does that make sense? Well, we're on the same page. So how did corruption enter to the world? Lust. What is lust? My desire for something I want. And that's how corruption entered into the world through lust. Now how does corruption enter into our families? Through lust. How does corruption enter into the church? Through lust. I want this my way. I want this. I think we should have this and I think we should do that. Corruption enters in by lust. But love is known by sacrifice. God so loved the world, he gave. The Bible didn't say God so loved the world, he took. But the Bible's super clear. God so loved the world, he gave. That's how God demonstrates love, by sacrifice. That's how Adam demonstrated love in the atmosphere of love. I mean, God, he set the atmosphere of love 
by giving everything he had made to man. He sacrificed and gave. He turned over rulership of all the earth and to Adam. And they, there was an atmosphere of love. God so loved, he gave. God, the God's giving, God's sacrifice is an expression of his love. And Adam and Eve loved one another in a perfect love and a perfect atmosphere. But the minute somebody went from sacrifice to take, to lust, corruption entered in. It began to destroy. And then once again, Adam demonstrated, when the woman went to lust, Adam demonstrated true love by sacrificing his kingdom, his lordship, everything he had, and his, his eternal life. He sacrificed all of it to preserve her and to redeem her. That was love. Praise God. Remember, we're talking about the atmosphere of love. So now, <clears throat> let's go to verse 5. Beside this, we're speaking of the divine nature, the nature of God. Brother Branham uses this to preach the stature of a perfect man, the perfect pyramid, man coming to adoption. He uses this for all of that. He says, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you should never be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you have faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, that's seven. Coming up the pyramid, there were seven steps. Coming up, ended in brotherly kindness. But the eighth was the capstone, and the capstone is Christ, which is God, which is what? Love. For God is love. So what is the capping off of this great New Testament church? It's love. What is the capping off of the individual? It's love. What is God? Love. What was God's love gift to the world? Jesus Christ. What is Jesus Christ? An expression of God's love. What are we coming to? What's the whole message to do? It's to bring us to adoption. What's adoption? When we come back in contact with love. And love comes down, and the Holy Ghost in love comes and vulcanizes and seals the whole works together and caps it off and finishes off and brings us back to what? Back to sons and daughters of God, because if God is love, his offspring will also be love. What are we building up to? What are we coming to? What is the end game? What is the goal? What are we trying to achieve? We're not trying to achieve to, to be the most gifted church. Let the charismatics, let the other groups have that. We're not trying to achieve the most numbers. Let other groups do that. But what are we trying to achieve? We're trying to come back into God-likeness, to be like God. That's why the message has come, to cap the church off, to bring us back to full adoption, to be once again adopted sons and daughters of God. Amen. So we're going to have to come back to this love, perfect love, come back to the love that God is. <coughs> it's got to go beyond human emotion because in human emotion, I will feel like it one day and I won't feel like it the next day. I'll feel like a believer today. I may feel like an unbeliever by the end of the day. I may feel like, yeah, I, I got it. I'm a message believer. And I may wake up tomorrow and feel like there's no chance in the world for me to be one of them. It's got to go beyond that. It's got to go back to the mind of God, to the true intelligence, the true reason with the true purpose of God, and we've got to connect with that to be able to operate in this atmosphere of perfect love. This is what the goal is. It's amazing how we can make the goal so many other things, but the capping off is love. It's the person of Christ. It's God himself. It's the very nature of God going back to its full. I just quoted to you John 3.16, but I'll quote to you again. For God so loved the world, he gave. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. This is how God demonstrated his love. Let's go to Mark chapter 10. I want to look at this story because it's really interesting to me.
Mark chapter 10, verse 17. This is the story of the rich young ruler. And in Mark 10, verse 17, he says, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running, and kneeling to him and asking him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? I want you to look at the piousness of the young man. He come running to God and kneeling. It looked earnest. It looked sincere. It looked like he really wanted it. He said, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Brother Branham said he was testing him here to see if the man would recognize that he's God. Why did you call me God? Do you know why you called me good? Because there's only one good that's God. Do you know why you? Praise God. Verse 19, thou knowest the commandments. This is Jesus' answer. He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He says, thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. So he says, I got it. You give me a list, and I put a check mark on each one. Check, 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 check. I'm turning my paper back in. For, for what? For eternal life. Jesus says, not so fast. Listen. To master, I've observed these from my youth. Now look at what it says in verse 21. Then Jesus beholding him, loved him. Jesus beholding him, loved him. Now this is a different kind of love than a, this is the God love. This is agape love. When Jesus looked at him, Jesus loved him. So when Jesus loved him, Jesus is actually going to go to the heart of the issue and give him a deeper penetration into his heart and give him the word. That's real love. Jesus wasn't going to say, you did good, you did good, son, go and enjoy it. No, when, when God loves you, he's going to come down and root out the problem that's in your heart. Amen. He'll, he'll, he'll play it on the tape. You'll be going down the car one day listening to a message, and all of a sudden, God will be rooting it down. God will behold you and love you and come right down to where your problem is. Or he'll bring a minister behind this pulpit who starts getting right down into the nitty-gritty of your life and exposing what's going on. Why? Because he beheld you and he loved you because he's got a love with intelligence, reason, and a purpose behind it. He knows what's good for you. He knows how to create an atmosphere where you can dwell in love. And it's not this emotional feel-good love. He didn't look at the boy and say, you did, you're a good boy. You, I can see you tried hard. God looks at your heart. Yeah, God was looking at his heart right then. And God beholding him loved him and said unto him, one thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. That was God's love. Sometimes it doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel like the preacher loves you. <laughs> it may not feel like the pastor loves you when he does one of these kind of moves. You know what the rich young ruler who had all his wealth and he loved his wealth and he loved his status and he loved his position, none of what Jesus said felt like love to him. So all you have, give to your poor, take up your cross and come follow me. And the young man's like, what are you, are you trying to kill me? You're trying to destroy me. That didn't feel like love to him, but it was love regardless of what it felt like. <clears throat> so, then verse 22, it says, and he was sad at the saying. He was sad. God had just given him the revealed word for his hour, and he was sad. He was sad at the saying and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Remember what he asked for at the beginning? What must I do to inherit eternal life? This man was sad because he didn't want to give up or sacrifice his earthly possessions for eternal life. He only acted like he wanted eternal life 
But when it came down to it, he didn't really want eternal life. Jesus was going to give the ultimate sacrifice of his life for this young man if he would accept it. But this man wouldn't sacrifice his material things for God. Jesus loved him, but he didn't love Jesus. Because we know love by sacrifice. This man wouldn't give up any of his money, any of his wealth, his prestige, his status, his rank in society. He wouldn't give up any of that to follow Jesus. Jesus loved him, but he didn't love Jesus. Now listen, the whole religious world, all they do is talk about how much they love Jesus and love, 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 and they write songs about love, but the fact that they won't obey his commandments proves that they do not love him. They sing about it, they talk about the love of God and the grace of God, and they love to receive God's love, but they don't give him any love back. And that's where this rich young ruler was. He was wanting to receive the love of God, but he wasn't willing to love him back because the loving back would require a sacrifice. He would have to surrender himself and give up his status, his prestige, his money, his rank. He'd have to give it up to follow Jesus, and that would have been his love for Jesus. And he walked away sad because he had great possessions. Oh, my goodness. So sad. That's one of the saddest stories in the world to me. He walked away because of what? Some money and a title? Say, God, let me have real love for you, where I'll lose everything and forsake all to follow you. Let's go to Matthew 22 together. Matthew 22, verse 36. Matthew twenty two thirty six 36 says, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? So one of these lawyers come, they, the Pharisees and the scribes, lawyers come to Jesus and they want to know, what's the great commandment? So Jesus answers, Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. What's the great commandment? What's the greatest thing? Love God. The greatest thing you can do is love God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. Then he goes on, and he says, and the second, this is the second commandment, is like unto it, thou shalt love the neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. When he says law and the prophets, he's saying the whole Bible. Because to that day, the whole Bible was the law and the prophets, the whole Old Testament, the Torah. And he's saying the whole Bible is summed up in this. The whole Bible hangs on two comments. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. What does that mean? That's the same kind of love that Adam had for Eve. That's the same kind of love that Christ has for his church. That's the same kind of love that a husband has for his wife. Amen. Nobody ever hated his own flesh, but loved and nourished and cherished his own flesh. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is the whole Bible. Is based on what? Love. The whole Bible to this date was based on one concept, love. Love God with everything you got and love your neighbor like yourself. This is what the whole thing's hanging on. My goodness. No wonder Brother Bram said, my whole message is love. It's the most powerful force there is, is love. That's the whole thing is summed up in love, but not the feeling kind of love. This isn't the kind of love where you can say, I love you, I I love you, uh, I hope you have a good day. This is the kind of love that will sacrifice self to give up self for others. That's God's love. That's that's love. That's how it's expressed. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2 now. In Revelation chapter 2, <clears throat> Let's look at verse 4. 
In Revelation chapter 2, he's got a message to the Ephesian church age, which is the first church age. And when he comes and gives the message to the first church age, in verse 4 he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Already, Christ, by his sacrifice, had created an atmosphere of love for the first church age, and already they had left their first love and began to grow cold. Brother Benham says in the church age book, he said, the fervent desire to please God. So this is what it means to lose your first love. The fervent desire to please God, the passion to know his word, and the cry for reaching out in the spirit all begins to fade. And instead of that church being on fire with the fire of God, it has cooled off and become a bit formal. That is what was happening back there to the Ephesians. They were getting a bit formal. The abandonment to God was dying out. The, the people weren't too careful about what God thought of them as they began to be careful about what the world thought of them. They had lost their first love. We had a, we had a wedding recently at the church, and in the church I was talking about this first love because the couple that we were marrying, they were so in love with each other, they, they had been so consumed with one another, they forgot the rest of us ever existed. I don't know if that's happened to you, if you've had anybody in your family get married or somebody in the church and, or a friend of yours, all of a sudden you're good friends until somebody comes along and, and then they, they, they start courting, they get engaged, and then all of a sudden you're on the outside. Why? Because in your first love, you become singularly focused on one object and only one object, and that's your spouse. And that's the way the first church was towards Christ. They were singularly focused on just one, and that was on Jesus Christ. They, they had abandonment to everything else. They gave up relationships. They gave up families. They gave up status. They gave up everything because they loved him. They sacrificed sometimes their wealth, their positions. They were outcasts from their families. They, they, were, they were considered renegades in the culture and societies they were. They, they sometimes were stoned and persecuted and chased from city to city. Why? Because they were, gave up, they had a total abandonment for one love, and that one love was a love that trumped all other loves, and that was the love for Jesus Christ. But already in the first age, that love began to fade and he says, thou has forsaken thy first love. This was the, the, the charge that God had char Christ was charging his church with. You begin to look around and you begin to preserve yourself and you begin to worry about your reputation and you begin, you're no longer willing to sacrifice for Christ. No longer giving all your time and all your energy and all your efforts and all your focus. I remember when I first came to the message, I didn't care if I had a job or didn't have a job. I was going to read the messages at night. I don't care if I went without sleep. I don't care if I got up early in the morning. It was everything to me. Was it the same to you? I don't care what my family, my whole family rejected me and thought I'd gone off the deep end. I was married one year. I was 21 years old. They said, that poor, dumb, young fella, he's got himself into a cult. They said, he's young and he's ignorant, which that was true. That was 100% true. I give them that. I was young and I was ignorant, but I had found the source of life. I had found the giver of life. I had found the lover of my soul. I had found the one who sacrificed himself for me, and I was willing to sacrifice my reputation for him. Guess what I didn't do when I first believed this message? I didn't miss church. I didn't skip devotions. I didn't fail to pray. I took a Bible to work and read it on my lunch break while people laughed at me and said, made snide comments. I didn't care. I was willing to lose all because I loved him back. I wasn't like the rich young ruler. Amen. He loved me with a sacrificial love. And when he asked me to sacrifice a little bit for him, I wasn't going to walk away because I had great position and prestige and a big family. I was willing to lose it all for him. That's a first love. Amen. That's the, that's the stars in the eyes. That's the singular focus. That's a young couple when they're first getting married. Amen. They don't really care if they're poor or they're rich. Me and my wife, when we first got married, we didn't have nothing. I had nothing. I mean, I didn't have a savings account. I probably had a week's worth of money in the bank when we got married. But we didn't care. I look back at that and I said, who in their right mind let us get married? Who did that? But for us, we didn't even think about it. We absolutely didn't care. 
I didn't care to leave the, the, the comforts of home. My wife didn't care to leave the comforts of home. All we wanted was to be together and be with each other. We were willing to give up all the easy stuff in life. I was willing to work an extra job. I didn't care. That's first love. First love, you know, in the first love phase. In the first love phase, your spouse is never guilty. You are. Anything bad happens, you say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't mean to upset you. I, I didn't mean to say that. I didn't mean to say it that way. You're so quick to repent. Why? Because you're in your first love. And you can't even see each other's faults. Other people will say, are you sure you want to marry that guy? He seems to be a little bit rough. You're like, what are you talking about? He's perfect. He's perfection in flesh. <clears throat> Your mom might warn you about that girl. You sure you want to marry that girl? I don't know that she's such a housekeeper. She's never been trained right. And you're like, what are you talking about? She's perfection in a human body. That's first love. First love, <clears throat> we focus on each other and nothing else. That's what the first church had with Christ, and that's what the first church lost. They begin to worry about their status in society, the way their coworkers thought about them, and if they were going to be able to keep material things. And Jesus tells them, I have somewhat against you. You've lost your first love. But Brother Branham comes along, and he says in the message Paradox from 1965, he says, we've got seven church ages, and we're promised that at the Laodicean church age, there would be another Ephesians. That's right. He says, and we're here. There's another Ephesians. We're going back to the beginning. We're going back to the start of the church. We're going back to what she was when she was a fresh new bride from fresh from Pentecost. We're going to be another Ephesians, another placing, another getting the word right, another, another putting the church back in order. And if we come back to another Ephesians, what did the Ephesians had? They had a first love. What's going to come back in the end time? We're coming back to a first love. Amen. But now we're coming back to a first love with a mature experience. When you're married and you're first married, you have a first love, but you have no experience. But now, after seven church ages, we've watched God faithful in every age. We've got God faithfully brought a revival in every age. He, he faithfully kept his word. He kept his promise. He never failed one time. He sacrificed and sacrificed and sacrificed. And we've got all this experience the church can glean on and look back. And now, it's, it's almost like coming to your 50th wedding anniversary and having confidence in, in a life of sacrifice, but going back to your first love with all this experience, knowing he'll never fail, knowing she'll never leave, knowing nothing will ever go wrong, knowing through sickness and in health and pain and suffering, for better, for worse, for good or for bad, and all of that, we've got all this experience after 40, 50, 60 years of marriage, she stuck it out through sickness and in health. She was here for better, for worse. He was there and richer and poorer. Now we've got all this experience through the church ages, but he says there's coming in Ephesians again in the Laodicean church age where we're going to go back to our first love, but not an insecure first love, not a first love wondering how it's going to work out. We've come back to a first love with all the experience of the church ages saying he's perfect in every way. He's here through the thick and thin. We stuck it out together, and I've come back to my first love. That's what the bride should be in right now. This is the bride's revival where she's come back to her first love with the benefit of knowing that he was there for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. Praise God. We should be the happiest people that have ever walked the face of this planet. <laughs> you know what's the only thing that can ruin this revival? If corruption enters in through lust. If we still want to preserve ourselves. If we still want to look good in society and have a reputation and worried about the other churches are thinking, that's the only thing that can ruin this revival. But if we can have that same abandonment that they had early on, we can have that same fresh experience with the Lord. What does he want? 
what, what is the goal? Where are we going to? We're going back to Eden. Back to first love. Back to the first condition. Back to pleasure. Back to the old atmosphere of love. It's bringing us back through our first experience. There's a line out of Song of Solomon <clears throat> that says in so Song of Solomon chapter six, <coughs> excuse me, chapter 6, verse 3, it says, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. And you have that revelation now? Have you come to that level of understanding that you can say, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine? That if you come back to that revelation, you can come back to that first love and that pure love, that agape love, because it's not emotional now. It's revelation. I came from the mind of God. I was, I, was, I was chosen in Christ, in him, before the foundation of the world. We were predestinated to be together. This isn't a natural union. This is a supernatural union between Christ and his bride. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. You remember how... <clears throat> Those of you who are married, when you were early on in the courtship phase and you were coming to the wedding and, and they were coming to engagement and how just her name, just his name would cause your heart to speed up. Just to get a chance to see them or hear them on the phone, it would have an effect on you. We need to be in that phase right now as the bride of Jesus Christ. When we hear his word preached, there's something inside of our hearts that speeds up. When we hear the Bible and says, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine, there should be a spark going off inside of us because this is a freshening, this is a freshening time. This is a restoration back to Eden, back to the atmosphere of love where he showed us all that he sacrificed, all that he's given, all that he's done. He's proved his love to us. And he's brought us back to the security of his love. We're not fearful of being cast away. We're not fearful of not making it. We're not fearful of, 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 of being a trade wreck on the side of the road somewhere. He's, he's brought us out of all that denominational thing and brought us back into the purity of his love where we were with him before the foundation of the world. And we can no more be lost than God can be lost. Brings us back to the security of love. I can't be separated. I can't be cast away. What do you mean I hope I make the rapture? I already made it. I made it in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. I can't miss the rapture. It's not based on my behavior. It's based on his love. It's his choice, not my conduct. Amen. But now my love for him will change my conduct. Now I'll sacrifice all my wants and all my desires because love is known by sacrifice. He sacrificed for me, and now it's my pleasure to sacrifice for him. Amen. This is where we're at. Back to our first love. Amen. Amen. Let's go to Romans chapter 8 together. Romans chapter 8. Let's look at verse 37. <clears throat> and now I want you to stop making fun of those young couples who have first love. That's a good thing. We should look at them and say, that's the way I should look at Christ. That's the way I should feel about my Savior. Romans 8, 37. Nay, in all these things are we more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Have we come to that realization? Have we come to that revelation? Nothing will separate us from his love. Brother Bram said in the message, Hidden Life, he makes this statement. He said, don't despise my ignorant, but I want to ask you something. Have you ever come to a place in life where Christ meant more to you than all the arguing you could do about your church? Has Christ meant more to you than all the world? I don't mean from an emotional or a mental workup. I mean from the depths of your heart that something's settled in there and something's taking place that you don't know how it come, but you're hid away and your whole motive is to serve Jesus Christ. Have you entered into that place, my dear brother? Have you come into that place where you don't care what anyone says, not to go out and act, act smart, but till the love of God is so anchored into you 
that you can't see nothing else. Your whole motive is to do the will of God. Love for everybody flowing free from everywhere. What a place to live. That's the hidden place. What's the hidden place in Christ? He just told you what it was, where you're so in love with him, you don't care about nothing else, but you're anchored in Christ and Christ alone. That's the hidden place. And then he goes on to say, that's the place where we got to come to, my brethren. And now listen to this statement. That's the place where God reveals his secret things. Why? Because he whispers love secrets to his bride. He, he pulls her up. Brother Brad says, you know how you pull your sweetheart up to you, the one you were going to marry, and you whisper those little love secrets into her ear? That's first love. That's the loving atmosphere. Now he's pulling his bride to his side right now, and he's whispering love secrets. Where do you find the hidden secrets? Where do they come from? From the hidden place. Where's the hidden place? When you enter into that love relationship with Christ. It's not church. Church has nothing to do with this. This is you and him. There's a total abandonment to everything else. Everything else in the peripheral just fades into blurriness. You're centerly focused on Christ, and Christ is this revealed word. That's the place where God reveals his secret things. That's the place where God does the placing and the calling. We've got to come to that love. Now, let's turn to John chapter 13. And remember, Jesus said that there's two commandments that the whole law and the prophets were based, were, were hanging on. The greatest is the love of the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. The second is like unto the first, love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two hang all the law. The whole Bible was hanging on this. And so God God wants us to have this loving atmosphere. And now we're going to talk about the church for a little bit now, the body of Christ. Because that same love that exists between us and Christ needs to exist between us and one another. John 13, 34 says this, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. When he says uh, as, that means you got to do it the same way he loved you is the same way you have to love one another. Not an inferior, not a secondary, not in a, a way. He says, love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have loved one for another. He didn't say because you can move a mountain with faith. That they'll know you're a disciple. You'll know you're a disciple because you have love one for another. Why? Because God is love. And all of his attributes must also be love. Brother Brother said in the seven church ages from 1954, he says, now John being old, that, that we are told by historians that he was brought to the church to preach, and he was so old, the only thing he could say was little children love one another. They're talking about the disciple John, when John, who owned the Isle of Patmos, got the vision and wrote the book of Revelation, amen, that John, when he was the only disciple that died of old age, they all died in martyrdom, but he died in old age, and uh, as an old man, he was too shriveled up, and he was too far gone to preach, they'd bring him on the platform and bring him in the church, and all he would do was shout from the corner, little children love one another. So what was John's last message? Love one another. The man who got caught up in the heaven, the man who saw the book being taken, the man who saw the seals being opened, the man who heard the voice of the seven thunders and knew what the seven thunders were. He's a type of the bride. You know, when he says, write everything that thou seest and everything that thou hearest and write it in a book, amen, and all of a sudden the mighty angel comes down with an open book in his hand with one foot on land and one foot on sea and a rainbow over his head and he cries with a loud voice and seven thunders utter their voices and then John says, I was about to write. Why was he gonna write? Because he heard what the seven thunders said. He had caught the revelation of the seven seals. 
He knew it. It was something intelligible, something that could be written down. And John received it. And when John received it, amen, in his old age, when he had got caught to heaven, he had seen through the church ages, all the way past the church ages, to the rapture of the church, to the coming of Christ and the millennial reign, all the way to new heavens and new earth and the throne of God established on the earth with the waters of crystal, the waters of life flowing down from the throne of God. He saw from, the, from where he was all the way to the end and to eternity. And the only message he had at the end was little children love one another. The most important thing he could say when he was feeble and he got to the end of his strength and he had nothing else that he could say, he, he preached them, he saved his energy, what little breath he had to say the most important message he could say and that was love one another. Because the capstone is love, because God is love, because the whole point was to come back to the realms of God, which is love. Isn't it amazing? His capstone message was little children love one another. So you think it's okay to have fights and strife in the church? You think it's okay to argue over what we think the thunders are? No, if we've seen the revelation of the book, if we've caught the same revelation that John caught, and we've seen the opening of the seals and the opening of the book, why we can't we come to the same conclusion John came to? It's all love. Amen. Brother Bram says he was so old he would say little children love one another. I tell you, that's a very good thing to preach on. Little children love one another. As I get older in the ministry now, about my 21st year, I think all the time as I go along, the more I think of the Lord Jesus, the more I begin to find out it's love that covers the whole thing. The love of God shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. Stature of a perfect man will lead us where? To love. The divine nature will bring us to where? To love. The capstone is love. And the capstones come down. The person of the word is here. The Holy Ghost is here to shed the love of God abroad in our hearts. And the message, the oddball from 1964, Brother Bram says, then I said, amen, I walked out the door. I'd, I'd say it would pay me every Sunday to drive up here. Have my children even to come up to sit under an atmosphere like this. Because it's always the atmosphere that brings the results. Brother Bram was talking about, he was up in Prescott, Arizona, and he was in a little house trailer in a little meeting with just a handful of people packed into a trailer. And Brother Bram saying, this atmosphere is what I love. Why? Because it was an atmosphere of love and of harmony. And he said, I would drive all the way up here. It was a couple hour drive for him. I'd drive all the way up here just to sit in this atmosphere. He said, it's the atmosphere that brings the results. You can lay a seed out there in the ground, no matter how much that seed is germatized, and lay it there. It's got to have an atmosphere to make it live. The sun has, got, has to come to a certain power before to bring it to a certain atmosphere. An egg has to have an atmosphere or it won't hatch, no matter how fertile it is. It's got to have that atmosphere. And I think that in a group like this, Christians hatch out, are born again, in such an atmosphere as this. This kind of atmosphere I was born under. No matter where I go, I visit the cold world and the mission fields and so forth. I could even stand and close my eyes and think of this atmosphere. Brother Bram said, you can hatch a chicken egg under a puppy if it keeps it the right temperature. You can hatch an eagle egg under a chicken. It's the atmosphere. Since said sons and daughters of God can be born again in the right atmosphere. It's the atmosphere that matters. When God was going to bring forth an Eden, he had to first create the atmosphere. He started with light. Then he started with the firmament. Then he got everything in the atmosphere right. Then he started bringing forth the seeds out of the ground. 
Then when he got everything right, he planted a garden. And when he got the garden just right, when the atmosphere was right, then he put his son and his son's wife together in marriage. Where? In the right atmosphere, because they needed to be in the right atmosphere. Remember he said he made his masterpiece and every master artist will put his his masterpiece in a beautiful setting so he had to get the atmosphere right so he could put his masterpiece in the atmosphere. And so that world that the atmosphere he made, it was brooded over with love and compassion. It was an atmosphere of love and joy and peace and that atmosphere they flourished in. Let's turn to, to 1 John. Let's just read that old disciple, John, who got caught up into heaven in Revelation chapter four, who saw it all. Let's just hear what he has to say in his epistles. First John. First John chapter three, verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God. Wait a second. Stop. He's going to show you how you can perceive that God loves you. It says, Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. You know that's how we perceive love? Is by sacrifice. Here we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us. How will the brethren perceive our love? Because we lay down our lives for them. We give to each other, and that creates an atmosphere of love. That's how we perceive love from one another. That's how a wife perceives her husband's love, because he sacrifices for her. Do you remember Brother Branham told a story about two, mar- two couples he married. Remember he said the one was a rich comp- couple. Her dad owned some businesses along the river. His dad owned some businesses. They were millionaires' children. And he said all the pomp and the ceremony he had to go through to get married, there was all kinds of fancy this and dressed up that, and he had to practice for weeks to come to the ceremony. They had the nicest of everything. They probably had the nicest reception. They probably had the nicest meat at the reception, the best decoration. She had the most expensive dress. They probably left in the nicest car. They probably flew and took the nicest vacation for a honeymoon. They had it all. And he married them and got them married and, and, and sent them off. Then at about the same time come another young couple. But this couple had nothing. They were dirt poor. This man worked with his, with his brother and he didn't have enough money. He wanted to get married, but he didn't have enough money to pay the preacher. And Brother Brandon's brother said, my brother was a preacher. He'll marry him. He don't charge for that. So they drive up in an old dilapidated car, and the girl got out, and he says she didn't hardly have a dress on and wasn't wearing any shoes. Talk about a difference. And he said the one they married in a big old nice church, the other got married in his living room, in his front lounge room. And he says, but they were married by the same ceremony. And he was asking the young fellow, the poor man didn't have no money, and this girl, she was young, looked like she was too young to get married, and he said, are you old enough to get married? She goes, I got permission from my parents. I got my permission slip filled out. And he started saying, now listen, what's going to happen, what's going to happen, sir, when times get tough? You know, times are tough now, and you don't have much money, and what if times get tough? Are you going to send her back to mom and dad? And he says, no, we'll struggle right along. He looked at the girl, he says, what are you going to do? Are you going to run back to mama if he can't pay the bills, if he can't buy you things? And she goes, I'll stick right with him. Brother Bram said, I felt little when I saw that he really loved her and she really loved him. That first couple, they were playing like they loved each other. But this couple really loved each other. Brother Bram said a little while after they got married, he started wondering how they were coming along. So he said he kind of slipped up on that first couple. He said they lived in a, in a palace up on the hill. He said their doorknobs were 24 karat gold. You remember this in the message? He slipped up there. He said before he got to the door, he could hear them fighting. They were in there arguing with one another. And he said they were fighting about some dance that she had went to, and she was a real pretty girl. And 
she was danced with some boy on the floor, and he said they were jealous of one another, and they were in there fighting. So Brother Bram comes up to the door, knocks at the door, and he says he's seen them from across the room. They come together, and they held hands, and they come and open the door. Well, hi, Brother Branham. How are you? He said, I'm doing fine. How are you all doing? He said, we're doing fine. And he said, we're doing fine. Aren't, aren't we, honey? He says, yes, yes, we're doing good. See, they were not willing to sacrifice for each other. They were selfish because they had been spoiled children all their life. They didn't know how to sacrificially love. They didn't know how to give to one another. All they knew was how to get everything that they wanted. And they were jealous of one another. Jealousy comes from pride. They were selfish. They were envious. They were proud. And they did not know they could not perceive love from one another because they, they, they could not give to one another. They had everything given to them. The husband never had to sacrifice for the wife. He got an allowance from his dad. She never had to sacrifice for the husband. They had servants. They had, there was no sacrifice in this marriage. There was only selfishness. But then he wanted to see how that other couple was getting along. So he was acting, he was acting like he was looking at the power lines. He was pretending. So he could get up close. He said the one lived in the palace, the other one lived in an old rail car. So we would, we, would, we would call it a shipping container. They had an old shipping container in the ironworks and he, he, had cut, he had cut a door, probably with a plasma cutter or a grinder, cut a door in the side of it and he, and he got a little box and he made a little stoop and found another little box and made a table and this was their home. And he slipped up to overhear their conversation. <laughs> And he slipped up and he, and he looked through the crack and he could see the man was sitting down and she was sitting on his lap. And they were counting a few coins that he had in his hat. He had an old hat and he had his hat turned upside down and there were some coins in the hat. They were counting those coins and he said so much for groceries and so much for the insurance on the car and so much for gas and there was not enough money left over. And he was saying, oh honey, I wanted to buy you that dress so bad. They're trying to figure out how to pinch their pennies. Why? Because he wants to buy her a dress. And he says, oh, I saw it in the window at the store. You'd look so pretty in it. I want to buy it for you. What is this wife recognizing? She's looking at sacrifice. He had dug ditches. He had been working in the trenches. He had been shoveling dirt. He had gained a few coins. And the only thing he was worried about was buying something for her. She was perceiving love by his sacrifice. The woman on the hill perceived no love. All there was was selfishness and jealousy and contempt and argument and bitterness. And now listen to what the wife says. Because remember, the wife is always the reflection of the husband. Remember? A man chooses a bride to reflect what's on inside of him. There was a reason this man chose this woman. And up on the hill, there was a reason that man chose that woman. They were a reflection of each other. She was a reflection of the inside of him. So he was jealous and spoiled. He picked one that was jealous and spoiled. This one down here had character and was willing to sacrifice. He picked one with character and a willingness to sacrifice. She's sitting on his lap. She goes, oh, that's okay, honey. I don't need a new dress. The one I got's just fine. What's she doing? Now she's sacrificing back to him. She's not pouting and saying, oh, isn't there any way? Couldn't we do something? Couldn't you sell something? Couldn't? No, she's a reflection of her husband. He's self-sacrificing. He's loving. He's giving. He's willing to work and work hard, and he wants her to have the benefit of his labor, and she's now here, the recipient of that love, and now she, and, and you know what, in reality, she didn't need a dress, because she had love. She said, I, I don't need, I really don't need it, honey. It's okay, that's fine, and she's got her arm around him, and they love one another, because love is sacrificial. Brother Brenham said, I turned around and looked and I could see that other palace up on the hill. And I said, William Brenham, which one would you want to have? And I ask you, which home would you want to live in? Would you rather have 24 karat doorknobs and a Cadillac apiece and contempt and hatred and strife and jealousy? 
Or would you rather live in the boxcar, the shipping container, and have genuine love? I don't know about you, but I want the, I want the shipping container. If you were a kid, which house would you want to be raised in? I wouldn't want to be raised up there where mom and dad are contemptuous and fighting and, and angry and bitter. I'd want to be right down there where I'd be smothered in love and parents who would sacrifice for the children. Now I ask you, what kind of church would you want to be in? Let's take these and make these churches. Which church would you want to be in? Would you want to be in the church where nobody knows how to sacrifice, nobody ha knows how to love sacrificially, but every idea they have is the best and we all got to do it this way? We'll argue over what time we should start church. We'll argue over how long it should go. We'll argue over whether we should do this or that. We'll argue over what atmosphere do you think are going to bring birth in your young people? Or would you rather have the church down here where everybody's saying, I really want to do this for you, and you're saying, no, it's okay, I don't need that, and no, it'd be better for everybody else, but it's okay with me. Which one do you think would be create a better atmosphere for children to be nurtured in? Amen. The same principles work from the top to the bottom with Christ and his church, with a husband and wife, with the church. It all works by the same principles and the same mechanisms. We're supposed to love one another. How will we love one another? How will we perceive one another's love? By our amount of sacrifice. Who's here willing to be here when the doors are open, to contribute their time and their money for the benefit of everybody else? Or who only comes when it's convenient to come and only gives when they feel guilty that they haven't given, or gives the minimum, just a tithe, but no offering? Because there's no sacrificial love for the benefit of the whole church. I don't know. I don't want to be in that church. I want to be in the church where everybody wants, I want to come early and create an atmosphere. I want to stay late and clean up the kitchen. That's the church I want to be in. I want to give extra so that we can, we can do a little something extra for Sunday school. I want to give money so that we can do a little something extra for a fellowship. I, I, I want to give my time. I want to give my energy. I want to give my efforts. And, and when there's a decision to be made and you think we should do it this way, but you see others are doing it this way, and it's really not a matter of the word. It's just a matter of preference. It's amazing how many times we take our personal preference and we try to attach quotes to it. Because we want our preference to be the word when in the bottom of it, it's just our preference. And we're willing to destroy the atmosphere for a personal preference. What happens if you win the argument but lose the atmosphere? Which do you think it's better to do? Lose the argument and keep the atmosphere or win the argument and lose the atmosphere? I say, let's keep the atmosphere. What atmosphere? The atmosphere of love. The capstone atmosphere of the bride. How is love perceived? It's perceived by sacrifice. Jesus' sacrifice, God's sacrifice, everything was a sacrifice. We perceive his love because he died for us. Now, how does he perceive our love back to him? Because we died to self, because we gave up our preference, because we gave up I want to live in the box car. I want that to be my mom and dad. I want to be in that atmosphere. But you wouldn't have any new toys. I wouldn't need any new toys. I'd play with a stick and an old bottle cap and be happy because mom and dad loved me. You could live on the mansion on the hill. You can have every new toy that comes out every year. You can have a house full of them. And, and, but you got mom and dad who are always fighting with each other and they're so upset with each other they don't even have time to pay attention to you. And you're a lonely kid growing up playing by yourself with all these toys and a house where it's cold and formal and there's a bunch of tension all around and this little kid knows it. I, I don't want to live in that house. I want to live down there in the boxcar. I'll tell you what church I want to go to. I don't want to go to the palace on the hill where it's cold and there's tension and there's undercurrents of ripplings of emotions and people upset with one another. I don't want anything to do with that church. Put me down here where people love each other. 
and are willing to sacrifice for each other and give their time and give their energy and open their home and, and give somebody the benefit of the doubt and quit it, making accusations and quit trying to pull to have it your way. That's the house I want to live in. That's where I'd want my children raised so the atmosphere is right so they can come to a birth. Why? Because it's capstone time for a capstone people. We say capstone, capstone. What's the capstone? Love. Praise God. I want to be a capstone people. I want to create a capstone environment and a capstone church, amen, for capstone children to come to a capstone birth. Amen. Don't forget, John the disciple, the one who saw more revelation than any other disciple, the end of his life, had one message. Little children, love one another. Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. How is love perceived? By sacrifice. You can say it. A man can tell his wife, I love you, I love you, I love you. But if he goes to work and comes home and goes out and plays basketball all night or he goes out fishing with his buddies every night and every day and she needs something for the house, she could use a new vacuum, she needs something for the kitchen and he spends all his money on fishing equipment, he never considers what she needs, he can say, I love you, I love you, I love you. But what she hears in her heart is, I love me, I love me, I love me. It doesn't matter what he's saying because he's demonstrating he loves himself when he loves her. That's what the rich young ruler was demonstrating to Jesus Christ. He said, I want eternal life. I want to obey the commandments. I've done all these from my youth. But when Jesus said, sacrifice yourself and follow me, his actions were saying, I love me more than I love you. And that's what a husband does to his wife when he spends it all on himself and he uses his time for himself and he never sacrifices for his wife. He's saying, I love me more than I love you. Praise God. Praise be to God. So Jesus said, greater love hath no man than he lay down his life for his friends. Greater love have nobody in this church than those that will sacrifice their time, their energy, their money for the benefit of everybody else in the church. That's love. That's love. Amen. Amen. I can say all these things because I'm, I'm not the pastor. I have no idea who's who. I don't even know who goes to this church. I can't even say these things in my church. So God moved on my heart and I said, amen. I'll just, I'll just go the way I feel led because nobody can accuse me of anything. I'm as ignorant as ignorant can be, but praise God, I love ignorance. So don't fill me in on anything later. God stirred my heart this way for a reason. I've learned that. There's a reason behind it all. Go to 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. I want you to read that again. In this was manifest the love of God. So how did God manifest his love? He gave. It's the same picture over and over and over again. It doesn't matter what you say. It's what you do that demonstrates love. And this was manifest the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us. Praise be to God. Now let's go down to verse 19. It says, we love him because he first loved us. Why? It's a reciprocation. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, 
How can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Two commandments the whole, the, the whole Bible hangs on. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. And the second is like to the first, love thy neighbor as thyself. Praise God. Let's go to 1 Peter. You know what I found? It's not the great mysterious mysteries that are tripping people over, up. It's the common, everyday, simplest of things that we're failing on. The things that actually cause us to sacrifice ourselves are where we're failing. We're failing to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Jesus. In some ways, we've lost our first love because in our first love, we loved everybody. I remember when I first came to the church, my goodness, everybody was a saint and I could practically see their halo. I wouldn't have believed anything bad you ever told me about them, and I didn't want to know anything bad about them. I loved everybody because I found a group of believers that believed the same thing that was treasure to me. It was life to me, and it was life to them, and they loved Jesus, and I loved Jesus, and this message was more than life to us, and they were my brother, and I loved them dearly. I want to keep that first love. Over the years, things happen and disappointments and discouragements and little, and little conflicts come up, and I say, God, forgive me. I want to go back to that first love. I want to think the best of everybody around me. I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. If somebody says they did evil, I said, I don't believe it. Somebody's got to prove it to me because that's my brother. I don't want to take a little hearsay and then spread a little hearsay and be embarrassed later when I find out it was wrong I'd rather have somebody tell me something a brother did and I say, I don't believe it. I'd rather be embarrassed by being too dumb to believe him than be embarrassed by spreading something that wasn't true. They'd be like, I tried to tell Brother Chad, but he didn't believe me. He's just ignorant. I'd rather be that kind of embarrassed than spread a little tale for somebody and, and ruin their reputation and later find out that the thing that I had said wasn't even the truth. That's way more embarrassing. I want to, I remember coming to church, I couldn't wait to get to church. I lived almost two hour drive away from church and I was there 45 minutes early. Why? Because the church was packed out and I wanted a good seat. Because I wanted to see and I wanted to hear. So God forgive us for that ever wearing off of us. Forgive us for losing our first love. But in Laodicea, there's going to be an Ephesians again. And I'm signing up for that Ephesians. Bring me back to my position. Bring me back to my first love. Bring me back to the passion that I had for this message when I couldn't wait to read another book, listen to another tape. I couldn't wait for the next service. God, bring me back to my first love is my prayer. Let me have my Ephesians. Maybe the rest of the church can't have Ephesians, but God's promise in Laodicea there'll be an Ephesians and I can have an Ephesians and I want an Ephesians. I want to be brought back to my first love, my first position, my first place. And I want to stay there. I want where everything else in my life on the peripheral begins to fade. It doesn't matter. If I lose my job tomorrow, so what? I'll find another one. As long as I've got this word, I'll be fine. As long as Christ is central in my life, that's all I want. And as long as I can serve the brothers and sisters, that's all that matters to me. Listen, there's some day... Someday, if the squeeze comes down, like Brother Bram talked about it, you may not be going to work anyways, and you may not even have a church to fellowship, but you know what you're going to love? You're going to love your brothers and sisters more than you've ever loved them before. When everybody starts shooting at you, and you run for the nearest foxhole and jump in, and you find there was that brother you had a disagreement with, and he's in the foxhole with you, and the bullets are flying over your head, you're going to be so glad he's there. You put your arm around and say, oh, brother, I'm glad to see you. Trust me, God's going to fix us. But I'd rather submit to this word than have to have outside pressure. I'd rather surrender my life and die to myself than have to have the forces of the government push us together to make us love each other. I'd rather do it by the leadership of the Holy Ghost in obedience to the word of God. 1 <clears throat> Peter 1, verse 22. 
He says, seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Unfeigned means without hypocrisy, no pretending, that you genuinely love them. And this, he ties it together with the purifying of your souls. If you look at this scripture and what he puts, unfeigned love of the brethren, what he attaches it to, it's amazing. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Fervently. That means desperately, passionately, strongly. That see, you love one another with a pure heart, no pretense, no putting on, with a pure heart fervently. That's not just, oh yeah, that's my brother, I love him. No, it's a fervent, desperate, earnest love we have for one another. That's according to the Scriptures. Amen? Let's look at verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You've purified your soul by obeying the truth through the Spirit, Unto, it brought you into unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again. So if you're born again, if you've purified your souls, and in between being born again and purifying your souls, these great important scriptures, is an unfeigned fervent love for the brethren. It goes together with the new birth and with the purification of your soul. Praise God. Now let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, and I'm actually going to close with this. First Timothy chapter one, verse five. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith. The end of the commandment, not the beginning, the end. That means the conclusion. The end of the commandment, the end of of the commandment, everything God's commanded in his word, the end of that is love out of a pure heart. What has God wanted? What is, the, what is the seven church ages supposed to produce? What is the restoration of the word supposed to do? What is everything supposed to produce in our lives? The end of the commandment is love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. What is the capstone? Love. Who is the capstone? Christ. Who are we? His body. And if we are his body, we should be living in the atmosphere of love. Love for him and love for one another. And in that atmosphere of love, we can bring back an Eden condition. In the atmosphere of love, an egg can hatch. What kind of egg? Maybe an eagle egg. Maybe a child can be born. Maybe there can be new births that take place in the right atmosphere. I encourage you, friends, don't sacrifice that atmosphere of love for anything. Don't sacrifice it for a preference, for a song, or for music, or for a church start time, or a color you paint the wall, or kind of meat you have in the fellowship. Who gets to teach Sunday school and who they chose to be the deacon and how often I get to preach. Don't give at fellowship. Don't give up the atmosphere of love that can bring a birth over such nonsense as that. If it's an issue of the word, stay with the word. If you separate over the word, that's a good reason to separate. But all that other nonsense of who preaches the most and he doesn't choose me and, and why don't I get to sing and my goodness, maybe you should just die to yourself. How about that? How about sacrificing yourself for somebody else? Do you really think if God wants you to preach, you're not going to preach? Do you really think if God wants you to sing, you're not going to sing? Do you really think man can override God's eternal purpose for your life? God has an eternal purpose for you. Nothing happens in the life of a believer without first crossing God's 
desk. He said, nothing's out of kilter. Everything's ticking right on time. These things have to be this way. So if you think that you're supposed to be this or you're supposed to be that, just hold on. If you are, God will put you there because no man is going to outdo God. There is none of these trivial things that are worth ruining an atmosphere in a church that can bring birth. Listen, you've got children sitting here that'll soon be teenagers. They've got to come to a birth. They don't catch it like they catch the flu. They can't just sit there in that seat and become a believer. They need an encounter with the living Jesus Christ. They need the atmosphere of the capstone for that egg to hatch. Don't spoil the atmosphere over your own jealousy, pride, envy, self-preservation, and need to promote self. Don't ruin Eden because of the corruption that enters in by lust. I want the attention. I want the notoriety. I didn't get picked. See how easy it is for evil to slip in under the fence in Eden? You say evil. That's evil. Because anything that would break that atmosphere of love is evil. There's no sense in playing games with it. It's the devil. Amen. I love being in a strange church with people I don't know because I can say anything that comes to my heart. This is freedom, friends. Amen. Keep the right atmosphere of love. And love is perceived by sacrifice. You know what it's like when the husband won't sacrifice for the wife, but he requires the wife to continually sacrifice for him? That's manipulation. You're manipulating her sacrifice for your own gain, but you're not sacrificing in return. Well, we do the same thing in the church when we, when we want everybody else to sacrifice for us, but we don't ever sacrifice for them. My idea is always right. I always know the word. I always have the right quote. I always know what the answer to the question is. Nobody else does. And you've never sacrificed yourself, your thoughts, your ideas, your perception, your preferences for anybody else but you. For you, every mountain's worth fighting on. Maybe you just need to sacrifice yourself and say, you know what? I don't really see it that way, but for the benefit of everybody else, I'll go along with it. I really don't think that's the best decision, but I realize for the sake of harmony and unity, I'll go along with it and we'll let God sort it out. Maybe it's best to preserve the atmosphere of love before anything else. I realize when I say I'm not talking about the word. If it's an issue of the word, stand on the word, even if it causes division. But most of the things that separate the church is not the word. It's usually some preference, idea, are somebody that elevates themselves and that don't like being in the shadows. It's a minister usually who doesn't like to be second to the pastor, and he's usually the one who splits the church. That's just what happens. Maybe what we need to do is sacrifice ourselves. Maybe what we need to do is die to self. Maybe what we need to do is follow Jesus' example that when he loved the greatest... No, no greater love hath any man than that he give his life for his friends. Give your reputation. Give your office. Give your position. Give your ideas. Sacrifice yourself for your friends. There's no greater love than that kind of love to give up yourself for the brethren. That's the right kind of atmosphere. Remember the other story Brother Ben was telling when the couple was in a divorce case? And they were getting a divorce, and they were in the house, and they were separating all their goods. You get the toaster, I'll take the microwave. You can have the sofa, I'll take the chair. They're going through, and they're dividing everything, and they're fussing about everything. This painting, no, that's my grandma's painting. No, I bought that painting. No, I. They're fussing about every decision and everything, but they're going through because the court's mandated that they divide everything. And so you get this, and they've got their own separate piles. I'm going to take this, and you're going to take that. And they're breaking up their home, and they're separating and they get up into the attic, and they go way back through a, a chest with some old things in it, and they come across the little baby shoe. And they had a little baby together that had died and passed away, and that started all the tension in their home and all the division because of the hurt. They come across the little baby shoe, and they both grab it at the same time. 
Brother Bram is saying, how did you divide that? How do you divide that? They both have equal claims to that child. When they found something they couldn't divide, they started weeping, and in a short amount of time, they were in one another's arms again, and they reconciled and come back together. They found something that tied them back together. You know what we need to reach for? We need to reach for this message that God gave us and get a hold of it. Come back to our first love. Come back to our passion. Come back to what united us in the beginning. Why are you at church? Why are you here sitting next to each other? It's this message of the hour that God's given us. That's why there's a people here. That's why there's a fellowship. That's why there's a church and a song leader and musicians and a deacon and, a, and trustees. The whole reason you're here is because God sent a message. Maybe we need to root around in the attic until we find that baby shoe once again. And then everybody get a hold of that and just be so thankful that God sent us a message. And we got brothers and sisters that believe the same message. And we've got an environment where we can grow spiritually into the perfection of love. And we got a place where our children can hear the message preached and they can fellowship with other kids until they come to their own new birth. Maybe what we need is to die to ourselves and come back to our first love. And the whole reason there's a message church in this city anyways is because God sent a message. And what is that message? It is Jesus Christ, the revealed word, your bridegroom. And he's your bridegroom and he's my bridegroom and how are you gonna divide him? I have equal rights to him as you do. I don't have more of a right than you do and I don't have more of a percentage than you have. You get just as much right to him as I have. And if we're all connected to Christ, we're all connected. To, Brother Brown said, this message is Christ. If we're all linked into that, it automatically links us into one another. And our love for the message should bring our love for one another. Amen. Maybe we should be able to sacrifice to keep our first love, to keep the atmosphere of love right, an atmosphere of joy and life and love where everyone can grow to the full potential God has for them. You know, just be below the capstone of love is brotherly kindness. And the word actually is Philadelphia. It's actually brotherly love. You know, brotherly love comes before perfect love. So before you come to perfection, you've got to master brotherly love. You know you only need to exercise brotherly love if you have a brother who needs you to love them. Maybe it's the challenges to brotherly love that demonstrate brotherly love. If everything's perfect, you don't need to demonstrate brotherly love. But not everything's always perfect and not everything always goes smooth and not everything's easy. That's when it's time to exercise brotherly love. And brotherly love will bring us to the capstone of agape love, which is God's love. Amen. Sometimes the most important messages are the simplest ones. Sometimes the things that we forgot is actually what we started with. We started, when we started in the message, we were just so happy somebody else believed it. I, I don't know if you all remember those days. Some of you maybe grew up and don't remember. I was just so happy there was other believers in the world that would stand and, and hug my neck, <clears throat> that would talk to me about the message. I didn't need to be a deacon. I didn't need to be a preacher. I didn't need anybody to listen to me. I didn't even need a vote in the church. I didn't care. I was just happy there was believers. I was just happy there was a fellowship. I'm just happy somebody else loved Christ the way I love Christ and loved me for loving Christ. Maybe what we need to do is find that baby shoe again and go back to what links all of us in love. Maybe what we just need is a greater degree of death to self. Maybe we just need to die to ourselves a little more because no greater love hath any man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Two commandments that all the Bible hang on. Love God 
love your neighbor as yourself. I think we can get this right if we just let the Holy Ghost have the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. And God bless you. Let's all stand. Let's just bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you, Father, for this time you've given us. And God, I realize that you've shaken us, Lord. Maybe you've opened our eyes again to some things we need our eyes open to. God, I know you never waste inspiration, but you sent this to my heart for a purpose. And I believe that it'll accomplish its purpose because your word goes out to accomplish what you sent it out to do. God, I pray that you help us all to surrender in a greater way than we've ever surrendered. For God, we need you, Lord. We need you to guide us. We, we can't trust ourselves. We can't depend on our own thinking. Lord, we can't even depend on our own feelings and our own emotions. They lead us astray constantly. But God, we need your love shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Your love that's perfect, that doesn't operate by emotion, but operates by revelation, by understanding of the word. Help us to operate in that perfect love, Lord. Forgive us for our failures, Lord, and I pray that you would just help us all to surrender ourselves in a greater way for the benefit of everyone around us. May we sacrifice lovingly so that my brother can benefit. May I sacrifice so my sister can benefit. May, all, may this be the greatest love among men that we lay down our lives for one another. God, I pray you would bless this church, bless this assembly, all that are gathered. And Lord, may they go forth from here determined more than ever to let that capstone live. That it's not something we talk about, but it's something that's demonstrated. That love isn't a word. It's made known and perceived by a sacrifice. For that's how we perceive your love to us. That's how we'll show our love to one another. God, help us not be like the rich young ruler that's not willing to give up but walks away. But Lord, help us to be able to surrender and to give up, Lord, that we might receive of you. We love you. Let this be a capstone fellowship where there's an atmosphere of love. And may your bride in this place grow to the full potential in that atmosphere of love of joy and harmony and peace, trust and security. May it be found, Lord, amongst these believers. We love you, Father. I thank you. and I pray you have your way with us. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Chris loved me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Loving, I love you because He
Chad's plans to come as we were um, communicating with brother Daniel White who helped us make arrangements to have our brother come since last year. So the plan has been there and we were just waiting for the right time for him to be able to come. And as he, the time for his coming was approaching, the prophet taught us, watchmen, what of the night? And the watchman has got to be able to be up there and look and see and be able to call out and warn the people. And I was seeing the thought uh, line that Brother Chad had as he was preaching. I also watched some of the services he preached in Brisbane. I wasn't able to see the services he preached in Melbourne, but I also saw some of the services he had just preached in his church, so I kind of knew his line of thought. Uh, but knowing what I felt was the need of the church, I was like, I don't know how the Lord is going to help us as a church in terms of what I felt needed to be preached. Amen. And I just thought we pray about it and we see how the Lord will come and use his servant. Amen. And the brother came, welcomed him. We've been having him at home. Never spoke about anything. Amen. Never spoke about anything, never gave hints, never gave clues. This morning at breakfast, the brother says, Brother, I've got a number of sermons that I felt I could preach, but I've prepared and my thoughts seem to be lining up with one. And I'm just still seeing how the Lord leads. I said, Brother, with the way I saw God come on the scene yesterday, I'm not even worried. I know God is going to come on the scene and he will give us spiritual food in due season. And I said, and, but what I would like to give you the testimony after the last meeting. I didn't want to influence the last meeting. So I said, there's a testimony I want to share with you, but I'll share it with you after the last meeting. Amen. And so we spoke about everything else, and then we come. Amen. And this afternoon, and the brother preaches the message that he preached. Amen. And it just goes on those channels that I felt on my heart needed to be preached on. Amen. And if anyone who's, uh, who knows the season, amen, understands. That's all I can say. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You may be small and insignificant, but God knows you. God knows your name. Amen. God knows who you are. And he loves you and he shows you that he loves you. You know? And he wants you encouraged. 
You can be in a valley, you can be in a difficult time, you can be disillusioned, but God comes on the scene in his own ways and shows himself to be God. And he comes in a season and speaks to you in a way that you have no shadow of doubt that he is talking to you. So you might go out and maybe still face the same challenges, but in your heart it's settled. Because God has shown you that he knows and he has told you about it, so you know all is well. Amen. No matter how long it takes, but the Lord will fix it. And that should be your blessed assurance. Oh, brother, let us give him a hand clap. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> ah, well, if, if, if you know Brother Chad, you would know he could have preached on the seventh seal. He could have preached on the seventh thunders. He could have preached on any subject if he had wanted to. But he had to preach what God wanted to be preached. In this season, in this place, to this group of people. And I think the Lord has been faithful. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. We'll just worship God as we come to a close without saying much. Just share the testimony. Amen. I'm actually tearing up. Amen. As I Let's just think the great physician is here. And just worship him as we are in his presence. Just to see how the Lord works. Amen. God answers prayer. Praise the Lord. The great physician now is near the That's me, brother. Being hard to cheer, oh, hear the voice of Jesus. Sweetest note, sweetest note, it's fair.
afternoon before your throne of grace and mercy I just feel led probably in this moment in time you heard what was preached you know the condition of your heart you know where you've been you know where you are you know where you're supposed to be you know if the spirit of the Lord was speaking to you you know what the spirit was saying with our eyes closed our heads bowed if there's someone who says the Lord spoke to me and you realize where you are, where you're supposed to be, and you want to lift up your hand, you want to lift up your heart and say, Lord, help me, because I see this love is not where it's supposed to be. I see that the revelation of this love has been escaping me. I would like to get reconnected with this kept, capstone of love. I would like to see this. I would like to experience this. I feel I've been losing it. But Lord, help me. If there's anyone who's in that condition, I invite you at this moment in time without worrying about the next person, without worrying about what the other person is thinking about because they are probably concerned about what you think about them. You can lift up your arms. You can surrender to God and say, Lord, as the prayer goes forth, Lord, speak to me, help me, touch me, quicken me, do something supernatural in my life. I want to re-experience that first love. I want that love of the Holy Ghost. I want that love of God in my life. I want to be able to realize my error and to move from henceforth in a different way. And the Lord who is faithful, the Lord who sees in secret, will reward you openly. He will transform your life. He will bless you. He will grant you the desire of your heart. Lord Jesus, we come as your people, Lord. I also have my arm up, Lord Jesus, because I desire, Lord Jesus, Father, a deeper walk with thee. And I come with my brothers and my sisters in your presence. Lord, you came. You used and quickened your gift, Lord Jesus Christ, to speak to our hearts. And Lord Jesus Christ, we know that when a man is in the channel of the Holy Ghost, when we hear that word that is spoken, Lord Jesus Christ, we know, Lord, oh God, that it, that is Theonustos. That is the breath of God. That is God's word. That's how you wrote the Bible. Because you breathed on the holy men of God and they wrote as they were led of the Holy Ghost. And when a man is connected to that channel of inspiration and they preach, it is God speaking to us. And Lord, we have our arms up, we have our hearts broken, Lord Jesus, and yield it to you. Because we recognize that you have spoken to us this afternoon. And we pray, O oh God, the same spirit that has spoken the word, may the same spirit quicken our hearts. Father, Lord Jesus Christ, that we may be strengthened. We may be quickened, Father, to fulfill your word. The way we are supposed to fulfill it, Father, even in this day. Now that the word has been opened. Now that, Father, we heard, Father, oh God, this message, oh God, that came to open and reveal the mysteries of God. The mind of God to equip the bride of Jesus Christ with that which will help her to overcome. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you visit each uplifted arm, each heart, Father, that is laid before you, that you may visit and touch and forgive and bless it. Lord Jesus Christ, and grant the desires of your people. We remember, oh God, this afternoon, your servant, Brother Chad, we pray for Father inspiration to continue upon his heart. We pray for your blessing upon him, upon his precious wife, Sister Angie. We pray, oh God, for his children. We pray, oh God, for the group of believers that you have 
assigned for him to lead, O oh God, that have sacrificed to allow him to come. We pray for your blessing upon them, that you continue to lead and guide them, Father, that you continue to bless them. We pray, O oh God, that these meetings may mean something, may be a marking point, a starting point of a deeper walk with you. Oh God, Lord Jesus Christ, a lift up to the stratospheres, Father, Lord Jesus Christ, for your children, that it may not be meeting after meeting, convention after convention, but Father, this may be, Lord Jesus Christ, an experience, a supernatural experience for us all, that Father, we may be moved to a higher realm. We thank you and appreciate you. Bless your people. Even the sacrifice that shall be given by your children. Lord, we commit it all into your hands. It is a love token, Father, but we pray that you visit and bless. Thank you, Father, as we commit to, oh God, even the few moments of fellowship that we have, we commit them into your hands that you be with us and may your love abound amongst your people. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. You may greet the brother, the sister next to you and say, God bless you, my brother. God bless you, my sister. Certainly was good to be in the house of the Lord together. Praise the Lord. Amen. And as we depart, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, this is good, is it? Amen. This is wonderful. Amen. All right. So, this is 4.45. We are supposed to be cleared out of the foyer area, 5.45. So I think we still have good time. Catch a bit of a bite, something to drink, have fellowship. Amen. And you can be able to greet and shake Brother Chad's hand in there. And we will clear if we have to, to go outside. My reminder is don't forget uh, our precious box that is there. Pass by and be a blessing when the Lord has blessed you. Praise the Lord. and. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank the team that was working behind the scenes, the tech team, the musicians at the back, the song leaders, uh, the deacons, the trustees, uh, the laborers that have gone forth, the kitchen team, and all the cleaning that's been happening. May the Lord continue to bless you, and may we continue to do more and more uh, and sacrifice for him and his people. Thank you, saints, all that visited with us today. We love you. We appreciate you. May the Lord God of heaven bless you. Amen. I think the brother will give us a dismissal song. Amen. And then we can be on our way. Amen. Please, I believe there's enough for everyone. We can pass by the foyer, uh, grab something, and we can greet and appreciate the other brother, the other sister as we part ways. The Lord richly bless you. So we return to our normal service routine, our Wednesday tape service in our homes, Fridays we come back to Oh, sorry. Friday is Easter. Next weekend is Easter. Sorry about that. I think we've sent out an email already. We have a meeting on Saturday morning, 9.30. I want to commend you. Most of you were uh, on time this Saturday in the morning. So Saturday, 9.30 and Sunday, usual time, 1 p.m. And Brother Daniel White will be ministering. So let's come and be in prayer for the meetings under expectation. So we do not have the Friday evening service. Next Friday evening, uh, we have the Saturday meeting and the Sunday meeting. If you are traveling out of town, God richly bless you and grant you journey mercies. Amen. Amen. Let's just put our hands together and thank the Lord for the services we've had. Amen. Just as we dismiss, we'll sing, Feel My Way Every Day with Love in key of F. Amen.
Big boy.